Psalm 23, we're going to read the whole psalm, and as I do that, uh, excuse me, before I do that, I want to draw your attention to something that I discovered as I was studying. There are names of God in the Bible, so many names of God. Uh, uh, Maybe a way for me to put it would be that there are so many ways that people have referred to God. He is our helper, he's um, he's our rock, you know, those kinds of descriptive names of God. Well, there are only seven times where we use the word Yahweh in connection to a name of God. When we do that, uh, when we see that, what, what we're indicating here is that it's, uh, it's basically a name that really is almost a sentence, if you will. Now, do you remember Psalm 23, verse 1? Now, some of us have, are newer to the church, so about seven, six or seven weeks ago, we looked at just verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Do you remember what that Hebrew word is for Lord? Somebody help me out. Yahweh. Yes, thank you. It was Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God, which is the great I am. It means I am, the ever-present one. The name itself means I exist. So we look at Yahweh, and when we look at Yahweh, there are seven different names that that God has. And I want you to see how those names, uh, almost, I guess all seven of them can be represented here in Psalm 23 in some way or another. So I'm going to go over the names, then we're going to read Psalm 23, and I want you to see why Psalm 23 is so much of an encouragement and a comfort to so many people around the world when we read it. I think one of the reasons is because Psalm 23 really captures all of these seven names of God. That's what makes it so rich and so beautiful. And sometimes we're just unaware of why it's impacting us the way it is. Well, look at these seven names with me. One of them is Yahweh Ra'ah, and this is the Lord is my shepherd. We get that from Psalm 23.1. There's another name in Exodus 15, 26 that says Yahweh Rapha, which is the Lord that heals, the Lord who healeth. So the Lord heals us. And then there's a third one that is Yahweh Sidkuno. This is the Lord our righteousness, or excuse me, Sidkinu. This comes from Jeremiah 23, 6. The Lord is our righteousness. Now, I'm only three in. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord who heals. The Lord is our righteousness. You can, you can almost even just begin to hear Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I have nothing that I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. That's the Lord who heals. He, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The Lord, our righteousness. Look at the next one. Judges 6, 24 is Yahweh Shalom. The Lord, our peace. That reminds me then, even again, of just he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He gives me peace. Yahweh Shama, The Lord is present. That's Ezekiel 48, 35. He says, even though I walk through this valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Yahweh Shema. Because the Lord is near. The Lord is with me. The Lord is present. Yahweh Yaira, or Jehovah Jaira, maybe you've heard it that way before. Yahweh Jaira, the Lord, uh, yeah, the Lord will provide. Remember the cup? The cup that runs over, the oil that he gives, the table he sets before us in the presence of our enemy. I see Jehovah Jireh there. What about Yahweh Nissi, the Lord our banner? This um, comes from Exodus 17, 8 and 5. This is the Lord our banner. This is basically the Lord, um, how, we're, how we're known. His, he, he is our banner. He is sort of the flag we wave. He's our pride and joy. He's the one who provides for us and protects us. This is the Lord our banner. And I think about the verse we're going to look at today, which is uh, the, this, the last verse there, verse 6 of Psalm 23, where, where he says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will live, or I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is Yahweh Nissi, the Lord, our banner, our dwelling place. So as I think about it then, I look at Psalm 23, and I, and I can see all, all seven of those names. Can you see them too? 
Maybe I've just convinced you of that. Maybe you should go study and see for yourself. But as I've studied this, it's been so rich for me to see just why, and maybe this is why, Psalm 23 has been such a source of comfort for us. It's here in Psalm 23, we see glimpses of all these names of God. So we come to Psalm 23 to be comforted by God. We come to Psalm 23 to to listen to him and and even, even to receive strength, as it says. He renews our strength. So let me read Psalm 23, and then let me dig into the last verse together. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He, lets, he leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. And even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely goodness and unfailing love, or surely goodness and mercy, shall follow me or will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. As we study this passage, I'm going to stop here in verse 6, and I want us to look at it just a little bit closer um, for the next few minutes. In verse 6, it says, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. As we start looking at this, I'm going to unpack it a little bit, sort of word by word, or maybe phrase by phrase within that verse. And the first thing I think that stands out to me is this notion of God's goodness and unfailing love pursuing us all the days of our life. In studying this a little bit, um, what I've discovered was that this word, uh, pursue me all the days of my life, is properly, I think, translated as pursue here in the NLT. Whereas for me growing up, um, the versions that I've used and that maybe that some of us have in our hands, it says that the surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And there's nothing wrong with seeing it that way. It's just that because we don't typically work with sheep, most of us are not shepherds. And so when we think about the goodness and mercy of the Lord following me all the days of my life, it's not really clear to me what some of us might envision in that way. So when I study this and look at it, what I've discovered, what I didn't know but then discovered was actually this goodness and unfailing love is pursuing us. And this word pursue is something that would be used even of ancient texts where they can find that this was a word, and even in the scriptures, a word that is used to describe an army pursuing its enemy. So some king would send out his army, and he would use this same word. He would pursue their enemy. You know, it's also used in sheep herding language, which is no surprise, right? Since we're in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Do you know, it's used in a way, uh, the way we could understand it is the way we would refer to sheep dogs helping to follow the sheep. Now, the way that we do sheep herding or cattle herding would be sort of from the back in the west out here. But back in those days, the way that the, sheep, the shepherd would lead the sheep is that he would be out front and the sheep would follow. They would listen to his voice. They would follow him. And at times, some of them would get sort of off track or off the path of righteousness like we've studied. They would get off of the path that the Lord or the shepherd had sort of mapped out for them to go. And you know who would be at the back sort of following them or pursuing them in a way? would be those sheep dogs. Now, when I think about that, nothing has been more profound for me in the last week and a half or so of just looking at this as realizing that those great sheep dogs of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, are his goodness and his mercy. He's not going to let you get too far off the track. He's not going to let you go too far away before his sheep dogs, his goodness... And his unfailing love or his mercy are coming after you to win you back over, to draw you back into those paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How beautiful is that? When I think about sort of sheep dogs, I would actually want to go to something like verse, uh, let's go with, with verse, the end of verse four. Your rod and your staff, they are like sheep dogs that bring me back in order. That's what I think. 
That seems like to me a more fitting picture if we were to imagine what would, it, what would God use if he were going to take us, if, if, if somehow we had gotten off this path of righteousness, this, this real sense of shalom, if we had gotten off this path of righteousness or off the path where the shepherd is leading us in some way, whether that's discouragement or sin or, or, or whatever it might be, we're off this path, we're following our own path like sheep will sometimes do. What I imagine the shepherd to use as a way of sort of sheep herding, as a way of sicking his sheepdogs on me at times, would be his rod and his staff. That makes more sense. And I think what strikes me here is that actually his rod and his staff are meant for protection and comfort. Don't get that mixed up. Now, when he's tracking you down with his sheepdogs, he's going to use his goodness and his mercy to win you over. That's why you can ask for forgiveness for the same thing a thousand times. Not so you can do it a thousand and one times. That's what Paul says. We go keep sinning so that grace abounds. No, God forbid. But the good thing, the good news is that you can sin a thousand times and you can come back. It's his goodness and his mercy that are relentless toward us. And they will in the end win us over. That's the grace of God. I feel like if I were to take goodness and mercy and put them together in one word, I think we could just sort of categorize them as just God's grace to us. It's his grace that is relentless. It's his goodness on the one hand, his mercy on the other hand, and they corral us like his sheep in following the shepherd so that, so that those are the things that win us over, so that those are the things that motivate our obedience and our holiness, our, our wholehearted devotion to him. This, for me, is what makes this even just more beautiful. Surely your goodness and your unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I think about this goodness. I think goodness is is kind of like grace in a way. It really is just a word that means good or or, or goodness in a way. It's, It's really just what would be right or upstanding or worthy. So we look at God's goodness here Um, There's another passage that talks about it. Psalm 100, verse 5. It says, For the Lord is good, and his mercy continues forever. His faithfulness continues to each generation. And we describe things as good um, in in almost a mediocre way, right? So if you said, how was the men's retreat last week, you know, this, this last week and yesterday? If I said good, you'd probably be like, huh, okay, not great. Right? It wasn't quite mediocre, but it wasn't quite great. Okay, well, you know, glad you had a good time. If you guys say good when I ask you how it was, I'm going to be sorely offended. <laughs> I want to hear great. That's what I want to hear. All right, I'm just kidding. But really, when we think of good, it always seems like this sort of like, well, it's just kind of like good, better, best, you know, that kind of thing, because that's how we use it in the English language. But no, we're talking about sort of the essence of God, one of his attributes. And so it really, it really isn't on that kind of scale for us. We're talking about his goodness to us. And I think for us, as we look at, at this goodness of God, I don't think it means that, that, that we live in a worry-free life. I mean, we've already covered that in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through this life, which is the valley of death's shadow over me, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with me and because his sheepdogs, goodness and mercy are keeping me corralled so that I stay on this path of righteousness for his name's sake. This is his goodness. This is all that he has intended for us for good. I think Romans 28 is a verse that we go to. It's worth bringing up. I won't spend a ton of time on this verse, but in Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. The reason I'm reading that verse is because I want you to see that not everything in our lives could be categorized as a good thing, and yet God can still be tracking us down with his goodness. In other words, we can be experiencing things that we would not categorize as good, and yet we can still know God and relate to him as good, and even experience his goodness in some of those hard things, or bad things, if I can say it that way. 
This, for me, as I, as I read this verse 828, and just leaving it up there for a second, I want you to see the word order here. It doesn't say, and we know that God causes every good thing to work together for me. That's not the word order. I think that's actually important. <laughs> he says, I think here, what he says is that we know God causes everything, the good and the bad, the ups and the down, the successes and the failures. He uses everything to work together for an end result that is good to those who love God. You see that? In other words, have you heard the cake example of the ingredients of the cake? Now, any one of the ingredients of the cake except for sugar would be nasty to eat just on a plate. But you mix it all together, the good and the bad, right? The salty and the sweet, and it makes a pie or a cake. It's kind of that way. I know it's kind of a loose illustration there, but it's kind of that way. God's taking everything in our lives, the salty and the sweet, and he's making it good together for those who love God, which tells me that it really has as much to do with our perspective too. In other words, to those who love God and understand his deep love for us, then I think for us, we're able to acknowledge more easily that he's working things out for good. I just know that about him. I don't know what this is, and I can't explain what that is, but what I do know is that he's good, and he's working things out for good. There's a measure of faith there. Right? It's not going to happen intellectually. You're not going to look at your circumstances on any given day, really, and just be able to sort of calculate, hmm, God's good. In fact, many of us are thinking God's not good because that's what we're doing. We're looking at our circumstances. We're looking around us. We're looking at that. It's not going so well. We're looking at that. That's not going so well. And the next step for us in terms of what happens in our head or our hearts sometimes is that, well, maybe he doesn't love me. Or maybe he's abandoned me. Or maybe he's punishing me for that thing I did. And I think what we have to see here in this verse in Psalm 23 that's related to Romans 8, 28, is that God is working everything together for good. And his goodness toward us, his loving kindness, his mercy toward us are like sheepdogs that corral us when, when our thoughts start getting away from us. So let's keep trucking, though. This is the good that God intends for us, but also just the nature of God himself as being good. God working everything together for good. And there's a number of examples. Uh, if we go back to Psalm 23, 6, that word of goodness, we find this word in the midst of hardship. I actually searched for it. I was looking really hard for it and found one person who had done like some kind of journal entry or, or, or study on it. So I really just cut and paste the five instances, okay? I put it in my own words, but these were five things that I saw someone had found, and these were basically times where the word goodness happened, or someone realized the goodness of God, it happened in the midst of a, of a hard thing. So I'm just going to list them. We won't study them, but one is that when we're suffering the pain of unfair and unjust consequences, we can remember the goodness of God, like a sheepdog bringing us back to our shepherd. Well, this is found, just if you're taking notes, you can study on your own. Genesis chapter 39, verses 21 to 23. Joseph was dumped into a dungeon because of a false accusation. If you're familiar with that story, then you remember that. He, he was dumped into a dungeon, to the lowest part of the dungeon. It was a false accusation, but it was carried out anyways. But the scriptures teach that he was given uh, essentially divine relief. And do you know the word used there? the goodness of God. God met him there. And do you know what God gave him? Just the gift of reassuring him of God's goodness. Right? When I pray, though, and I'm thinking about a hard situation, I don't usually pray, God, show me your goodness and show that to me. I usually pray, Lord, resolve this issue as soon as you can. <laughs> Get rid of this pain point as soon as you can. Work this out. Make it clear. Open that door. Let it happen my way, please, just to be transparent. And what happens here in the middle of the dungeon for Joseph is that God comes to him, meets him there, and it says the Lord was good to Joseph. He showed him goodness. Now think about that. He's in a dungeon. He's been falsely accused, and that's why he's in this dungeon. This comes after him having been betrayed by his brothers, and the Lord comes to him and affirms goodness. 
There's a few other examples. Another time is that when we're enduring the, the grief of death, the death of a loved one or someone close to us, in Ruth chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, shortly after the death of her sons, um, the, uh, the mother-in-law there of Ruth, Naomi, asks the Lord to grant her grieving daughters goodness. Basically, Lord, they've lost their husbands. Be good to them. Show them goodness. Is another example. When we're struggling with the limitations of either a handicap or a significant setback, there's the story of uh, Mephibosheth, and that's quite a mouthful, but there's a guy's name who is Mephibosheth, and uh, it's maybe one of my favorite stories about the goodness and grace of God in the Bible. It's found here of uh, Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you're going to take any notes, write that down and just go study it. 2 Samuel chapter 9. What happens is that David extends goodness to Mephibosheth, who is a crippled son of Jonathan, who is the son of Saul, the king who tried so desperately to kill David before he became king. Now, when the former king passes, then you kill all of his sons. You don't want any threat to the kingdom. You don't want any threat to the throne. Anyone sort of 10 years later saying, well, I'm the rightful king since my dad used to be the king. Typically, you just kill them all. And Mephibosheth here was actually granted goodness by David, invited, <laughs> you know, into the temp, into, excuse me, into, the, into his own um, home, into his own uh, castle, if, I, if you will, and then asked to seat at his table and treated him as one of his own brothers, as one of his own sons. That's goodness. Now, I feel like we could park there for a second and just describe the goodness of God that way. Like, like sons and daughters of the enemy, God, our good father, who created us in love, has dealt with our rebellion in such a way as to send his son to take our place and our punishment in our place for our sins so that he could receive us who were traitors as his sons and daughters. So he could go beyond just sort of, you're allowed to live in my territory, just don't come within 50 yards. It goes beyond that. God, our heavenly father, is like David who shows such goodness to those of us who used to be his enemy because of our own rebellion towards him, he, he saves us and he brings us into his own dwelling place and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Remember that from Psalm 23? He brings us into his own dwelling place and then he, sets us at his, he sits us down at his own table as though we were one of his own family members and that's because we are his family. And that's the good news. That's the beauty of his goodness. And that and that alone, on some days, maybe our worst days, is the only thing that can awaken us to the goodness of God. So we run to that, and we give him thanks, and we acknowledge his goodness in the midst of ups and downs. There's a couple more here. I'll just read them quickly. When we're hurting physically, do you remember Job? Was there anyone in the Bible, maybe except for Jesus, besides Job, who suffered so tremendously physically? And yet, in Job chapter 10, verse 12, the Lord gives goodness to Job, shows him his goodness in the midst of that hurting. Well, that's what the Lord can do for you. He can affirm that. He can just affirm that by just me saying, God is good, and he intends good for you, and he loves you, and he's working these things out, all of them, the good and bad, for good. And then I'm going to hope that the Spirit just applies that to our hearts and confirms us with this message of good. There's another one here too. It's when we're under a cloud of guilt after we've committed a transgression or a sin. In Psalm 32, which is a record of David confessing his own sin, and in Psalm 51, another record of David confessing his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband so he could play it all off. Well, in that setting, David speaks of gratitude to God for showing him goodness in the midst of his own sin. I think that pretty well covers it. Just about anything we're going through, it's the goodness of God that chases us down like, sheep, like a sheepdog would when, we've, when we're starting to stray. Well, let me, let me keep pushing into this. It's his goodness and his unfailing love, his loving kindness or his mercy. 
<clears throat> this, this mercy of God here where it says, surely your goodness and unfailing love or your mercy toward us, it speaks of God's commitment to us. It's not just his disposition toward us, it's, it's even his own commitment toward us. In other words, God is committed to his unfailing love. That's what unfailing means. It means that not only is it unconditional, it means you cannot exhaust the love of God. And it's based on his commitment to you. He's not going to sleep with you and give you three years to figure out just how committed he is. You're not going to walk in that kind of confusion. There's commitment on his part. And his disposition toward you is one of commitment. It is love. It is goodness. And it is unfailing love. He's committed to you. And so when you come to him in your sin or in your sorrow or in your struggle, you're not coming to a God who's somewhat reluctant because that was a little too far. You're coming to a God that says, I'm committed to this thing. I'm all in, and I'm all in to save you. I'm all in to rescue you. I'm all in to welcome you. It's his goodness and his mercy that at the end of the day are like sheepdogs that corral us back in to the fold of God, back in to righteousness, back into holiness, back into all of his plans for our lives. It's his goodness and his unfailing love. And that's the beauty of it. There's a verse, I, I'd mentioned it uh, to some of the fellas um, at the men's retreat yesterday, but there's a verse in the scriptures that, that teach us that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Or in some translations say, the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And the way I've seen that in the past at times has been that, well, God will actually do some things to really just break you down so you finally just repent. And although you hate that, it's really just God's goodness to you, man because in the end, you're going to wake up and repent. Well, that is one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is that God's actual goodness toward you makes you want to repent. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's looking at him, realizing that after all I've done, he'll forgive me again. After all I've done, he's still good to me. It's that unfailing love, it's that goodness of God that leads us to a place over time where we begin to say, I don't want sin. I could, but I don't want to. I'd rather follow the shepherd. I'd rather listen to his voice. I'm won over by his goodness, by his unfailing love. And for me, this speaks mostly to the motivational structure here in terms of obedience. Yes, we are to obey the Lord. And yes, we give our whole hearts to holiness and devotion to him. But we're motivated by his goodness, by his unfailing love. That's the beauty of what's happening here. It says, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me like sheepdogs all the days of my life. All the days of my life. Through the ups and the downs, and what I love here is the very first word in that verse, surely. Some of us would say, maybe. And at the end, we'd say, all the days of my life, well, maybe some of those days. And all I want to do is, as we wrap this up is just to convince us that surely goodness and mercy, no doubt about it in, this, in David's mind, no doubt about it, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He seems convinced. That's my hope for us, that we would be convinced. Surely goodness and mercy. Just as surely as we will sin, the goodness and mercy of God are, are, are as sure to track us down. So where are you at? What are some of your thoughts as you process the, the, the goodness and the mercy of God as sheepdogs in a way of tracking us down? What we realize for us really is that whatever condition we're in, the love and the mercy of God are unending. Can I read some verses? Just listen to the word of God speak to us. I could talk another hour. Any, any one of us could talk another hour on the goodness and unfailing love of the Lord. Just listen to these verses, Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were sinners. Talk about being seated at the table in the presence of your enemies. No one understands that more than our Savior Christ. 
And yet he showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were his enemies. Look at Romans 5.1, though, in light of that, in light of the goodness and mercy of God saving us. In Romans 5.1, it says, Therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith in Jesus, we have peace or shalom with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. How beautiful is that? If you're waiting to begin to praise God for his goodness and his unfailing love until that thing you're praying for gets worked out, you might, you, you, you know, you might be waiting for a really long time. Or you might be missing the greatest source of joy that you could find in the midst of that hardship. In other words, it's not the resolution to every disaster that brings us joy. We can't ride the roller coaster of circumstance and situation in life. What keeps us steady is the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of his unfailing love and mercy toward us. And that's what we're reading here in Romans 5. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Look at Romans 8.1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. It doesn't say no consequences. It just says no condemnation. In other words, God will allow things to happen in in our lives. There may be situations of suffering and hardship. There may even be consequences for our own wrongdoing. And in all of that, what the Lord is promising is that I will never leave you. You will never face final condemnation from me. There's hope there. I think there's mercy and love here. But it doesn't end there. This, this sheepdog of his mercy is on our tail as well. It says, 1 John 1, 8 and 9, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Now, what we could say there if we were to use some Psalm 23 language is, Surely I will sin all the days of my life. That's what he's saying. This is 1 John 1, 8. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But this is where surely goodness and mercy come in. Verse 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Isn't that good news? We have a Lord who loves us like that. A shepherd, Yahweh, who really does care, who really draws near, and who actually sicks his sheepdogs on us. His goodness is coming after me, not his rod. His unfailing love and mercy are coming after me, not his staff. I just find that fascinating as I study it. He's a merciful God who loves us all the days of our lives. That's Hebrews 13, 5. He says, don't love money. We could probably do that, you know, next Sunday. Don't love money, he says, but be satisfied with what you have. I hear Psalm 23 there. Leads me beside still waters. Lets me lay down in green meadows. Be satisfied with what you have. Now why? For God has said, This is Hebrews 13, 5. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. All the days of my life, every single day. That's good news. Every single day, just as surely as we sin, he is as sure to show us his goodness and his loving kindness. Psalm 56, 9 says, My enemies retreat when I call to you for help, because this I know, God is on my side. He's for us. He loves us. He gave his son in our place. There's no greater news than this. So let me read it again, and then I'll close. Hebrews 5, 13. God himself has said, I will never let you out of my hand. I will never lose you. I will never abandon you. I will never forsake you. Let's pray.